The deliberations conducted in London have a far-reaching importance, and so the decision issued from the fog-veiled offices of the Borneo Company darkened for Almayer the brilliant sunshine of the tropics and added another drop of bitterness to the cup of his disenchantments. The claim to that part of the east coast was abandoned, leaving the Pante River under the nominal power of Holland. In Sambir, there was joy and excitement. The slaves were hurried out of sight into the forest and jungle, and the flags were run up to tall poles in the Rajah's compound in expectation of a visit from Dutch man-of-war boats. The frigate remained anchored outside the mouth of the river, and the boats came up in a tow of the steam launch, threading their way cautiously amongst a crowd of canoes filled with gaily dressed Malays. The officer in command listened gravely to the loyal speeches of Lakamba, returned the salams of Abdullah, and assured those gentlemen and choice Malay of the great Rajas down in Batavia, friendship and goodwill towards the ruler and inhabitants of this model state of Sambir. Almayer, from his veranda, watched across the river the festive proceedings, heard the report of brass guns saluting the new flag presented at Lakamba, and the deep murmur of the crowd of spectators surging around the stockade. The smoke of the firing rose in white clouds on the green background of the forests, and he could not help comparing his own fleeting hopes to the rapidly disappearing vapor. He was by no means patriotically elated by the event, yet he had to force himself into a gracious behavior when the official reception being over, the naval officers of the commission crossed the river to pay a visit to the solitary white man of whom they had heard, no doubt wishing also to catch a glimpse of his daughter. In that they were disappointed, Nina refusing to show herself, but they seemed easily consoled by the gin and cheroots set before them by the hospitable Amleyer, and sprawling comfortably on the lame armchairs under the shade of the veranda while the blazing sunshine outside seemed to set the great river simmering in the heat. They filled the little bungalow with the unusual sounds of European languages, with noise and laughter produced by naval witticisms at the expense of the fat Lakamba, whom they had been complimenting so much that very morning. The younger men, in an excess of good fellowship, made their host talk, and Almayer, excited by the sight of European faces, by the sound of European voices, opened his heart before the sympathizing strangers, unaware of the amusement the recital of his many misfortunes caused to those future admirals. They drank his health, wished him many big diamonds and a mountain of gold, expressed even an envy of the high destinies awaiting him yet. Encouraged by so much friendliness, the gray-headed and foolish dreamer invited his guests to visit his new house. They went there through the long grass in a straggling procession while their boats were got ready for the return down the river in the cool of the evening, and in the great empty rooms where the tepid wind, entering through the sashless windows, whirled gently the dried leaves and the dust of many days' neglect, Almayer in his white jacket and flowered sarong, surrounded by a circle of glittering uniforms, stamped his foot to show the solidity of the neatly fitting floors, and expatiated upon the beauties and convenience of the building. They listened and assented, amazed by the wonderful simplicity and the foolish hopefulness of the man, till Almayer, carried away by his excitement, disclosed his regret at the non-arrival of the English, who knew how to develop a rich country, as he expressed it. There was a general laugh amongst the Dutch officers at that unsophisticated statement, and a move was made toward the boats. But when Almayer, 
stepping cautiously on the rotten boards of the lingard jetty tried to approach the chief of the commission with some timid hints anent the protection required by the dutch subject against the wily arabs that salt water diplomat told him significantly that the arabs were better subjects than hollanders who dealt illegally in gunpowder with the malays the innocent Almeyer recognized there at once the oily tongue of Abdullah and the solemn persuasiveness of Lakamba. But ere he had time to frame an indignant protest, the steam launch and the string of boats moved rapidly down the river, leaving him on the jetty, standing open-mouthed in his surprise and anger. There are thirty miles of river from Sambir to the gem-like islands of the estuary, where the frigate was awaiting the return of the boats. The moon rose long before the boats had traversed half that distance, and the black forest, sleeping peacefully under her cold rays, woke up that night to the ringing laughter in the small flotilla provoked by some reminiscence of Almayer's lamentable narrative. Saltwater jests at the poor man's expense were passed from boat to boat. The non-appearance of his daughter was commented upon with severe displeasure, and the half-finished house built for the reception of Englishmen received on that joyous night the name of Almayer's Folly by the unanimous vote of the light-hearted seamen. For many weeks after this visit, Life in Sambir resumed its even and uneventful flow, each day's sun shooting its morning rays above the treetops, lit up the usual scene of daily activity, Nina walking on the path that formed the only street in the settlement, saw the accustomed sight of men lolling on the shady side of the houses, on the high platforms, of women busily engaged in husking the daily rice, of naked brown children racing along the shady and narrow paths leading to the clearings. Jim Eng, strolling before his house, greeted her with a friendly nod before climbing up indoors to seek his beloved opium pipe. The elder children clustered round her, daring from long acquaintance, pulling the skirts of her white robe with their dark fingers, and showing their brilliant teeth in expectation of a shower of glass beads. She greeted them with a quiet smile, but always had a few friendly words for a Siamese girl, a slave owned by Bulangi, whose numerous wives were said to be of a violent temper. Well-founded rumors said also that the domestic squabbles of that industrious cultivator ended generally in a combined assault of all his wives upon the Siamese slave. The girl herself never complained, perhaps from dictates of prudence, but more likely through the strange, resigned apathy of half-savage womankind. From early morning she was to be seen on the paths amongst the houses, by the riverside or on the jetties, the tray of pastry it was her mission to sell, skillfully balanced on her head. During the great heat of the day, she usually sought refuge in Al Mayer's campong, often finding shelter in a shady corner of the veranda, where she squatted with her tray before her when invited by Nina. For Mme. Poutier, she had always a smile, but the presence of Mrs. Al Mayer, the very sound of her shrill voice, was the signal for her hurried departure. To this girl, Nina often spoke. The other inhabitants of Sambir seldom or never heard the sound of her voice. They got used to the silent figure, moving in their midst, calm and white-robed, a being from another world and incomprehensible to them. Yet Nina's life, for all her outward composure, for all the seeming detachment from the things and people surrounding her, was far from quiet in consequence of Mrs. Almayer being much too active for the happiness and even safety of the household. She had resumed some intercourse with Lakamba, not personally, it is true, for the dignity of that potentate kept him inside his stockade, but through the agency of that potentate's prime minister, 
harbor master, financial advisor, and general factotum. That gentleman, of Sulu origin, was certainly endowed with statesmanlike qualities, although he was totally devoid of personal charms. In truth, he was perfectly repulsive, possessing only one eye and a pockmarked face, with nose and lips horribly disfigured by smallpox. This unengaging individual often strolled into Al Mayer's garden in unofficial costume, composed of a piece of pink calico round his waist. There, at the back of the house, squatting on his heels on scattered embers in close proximity to the great iron boiler where the family daily rice was being cooked by the women under Mrs. Almayer's superintendence, did that astute negotiator carry on long conversations in Sulu language with Almayer's wife. What the subject of their discourses was might have been guessed from the subsequent domestic scenes by Almayer's hearthstone. Of late, Almayer had taken to excursions up the river in a small canoe with two paddlers and the faithful Ali for a steersman. He would disappear for a few days at a time. All his movements were no doubt closely watched by Lakamba and Abdullah, for the man once in the confidence of Raja Laut was supposed to be in possession of valuable secrets. The coast population of Borneo believes implicitly in diamonds of fabulous value in gold mines of enormous richness in the interior, and all those imaginings are heightened by the difficulty of penetrating far inland, especially on the northeast coast, where the Malays and the river tribes of Dayaks or headhunters are eternally quarreling. It is true enough that some gold reaches the coast in the hands of the Dayaks when, during short periods of truce in the desultory warfare, they visit the coast settlements of Malays and so the wildest exaggerations are built up and added to on the slight basis of that fact. Almayer, in his quality of white man, as Lingard before him, had somewhat better relations with the upriver tribes. Yet even his excursions were not without danger, and his returns were eagerly looked for by the impatient Lakamba. But every time the Raja was disappointed, Vain were the conferences by the rice pot of his factotum, Babalachi, with the white man's wife. The white man himself was impenetrable, impenetrable to persuasion, coaxing, abuse, to soft words and shrill revilings, to desperate beseechings or murderous threats. For Mrs. Almayer, in her extreme desire to persuade her husband, into an alliance with Lakamba, played upon the whole gamut of passion. With her soiled robe wound tightly under the armpits across her lean bosom, her scant grayish hair tumbled in disorder over her projecting cheekbones and suppliant attitude, she depicted with shrill volubility the advantages of close union with a man so good and so fair dealing. Why don't you go to the Raja, she screamed. Why do you go back to those Dayaks in the great forest? They should be killed. You cannot kill them, you cannot, but our Raja's men are brave. You tell the Raja where the old white man's treasure is. Our Raja is good. He is our very grandfather, Datu Bissar. He will kill those wretched Dayaks, and you shall have half the treasure. Oh, Caspar, tell us where the treasure is. Tell me, tell me, out of the old man's Surat, where you read so often at night. On those occasions, Almayer sat with rounded shoulders bending to the blast of his domestic tempest, accentuating only each pause in the torrent of his wife's eloquence by an angry growl. There is no treasure. Go away, woman exasperated by the sight of his patiently bent back she would at last walk round so as to face him across the table 
and clasping her robe with one hand, she stretched the other lean arm and claw-like hand to emphasize, in a passion of anger and contempt, the rapid rush of scathing remarks and bitter cursings heaped on the head of the man unworthy to associate with brave Malay chiefs. It ended generally by Almayer rising, slowly his long pipe in hand, his face set into a look of inward pain, and walking away in silence. He descended the steps and plunged into the long grass on his way to the solitude of his new house, dragging his feet in a state of physical collapse from disgust and fear before that fury. She followed to the head of the steps and sent the shafts of indiscriminate abuse after the retreating form, and each of those scenes was concluded by a piercing shriek reaching him far away. You know, Caspar, I am your wife, your own Christian wife, after your own blonda law, for she knew that she was the bitterest thing of all, the greatest regret of that man's life. All these scenes Nina witnessed unmoved. She might have been deaf, dumb, without any feeling, as far as any expression of opinion went, yet oft when her father had sought the refuge of the great dusty rooms of Almayer's folly, and her mother, exhausted by rhetorical efforts, squatted wearily on her heels with her back against the leg of the table, Nina would approach her curiously, guarding her skirts from beetle juice besprinkling the floor, and gaze down upon her as one might look into the quiescent crater of a volcano after a destructive eruption. Mrs. Almayer's thoughts, after these scenes, were usually turned into a channel of childhood reminiscences, and she gave them utterance in a kind of monotonous recitative, slightly disconnected, but generally describing the glories of the Sultan of Sulu, his great splendor, his power, his great prowess, the fear which benumbed the hearts of white men at the sight of his swift piratical prowls. And these muttered statements of her grandfather's might were mixed up with bits of latter recollections, where the great fight with the white devil's brig and the convent life in Samarang occupied the principal place. At that point she usually dropped the thread of her narrative, and pulling out the little brass cross always suspended round her neck, she contemplated it with superstitious awe. That superstitious feeling connected with some vague talismanic properties of the little bit of metal, and the still more hazy but terrible notion of some bad gins and horrible torments invented, as she thought, for her especial punishment by the good mother superior in the case of the loss of the above charm, were Mrs. Almayer's only theological luggage for the stormy road of life. Mrs. Almayer had, at least, something tangible to cling to, but Nina, brought up under the Protestant wing of the proper Mrs. Vink, had not even a little piece of brass to remind her of past teaching. And listening to the recital of those savage glories, those barbarous fights and savage feasting, to the story of deeds valorous, albeit somewhat bloodthirsty, where a man of her mother's race shone far above the orang blanda, she felt herself irresistibly fascinated and saw with vague surprise the narrow mantle of civilized morality in which good-meaning people had wrapped her young soul, fall away, and leave her shivering and helpless as if on the edge of some deep and unknown abyss. Strangest of all, this abyss did not frighten her when she was under the influence of the witch-like being she called her mother. She seemed to have forgotten, in civilized surroundings, her life before the time when Lingard had, so to speak, kidnapped her from the brow. Since then, she had Christian teaching, social education, and a good glimpse of civilized life. Unfortunately, her teachers did not understand her nature, 
and the education ended in a scene of humiliation and an outburst of contempt from white people for her mixed blood. She had tasted the whole bitterness of it and remembered distinctly that the virtuous Mrs. Vink's indignation was not so much directed against the young man from the bank as against the innocent cause of that young man's infatuation. And there was also no doubt in her mind that the principal cause of Mrs. Vink's indignation was the thought that such a thing should happen in a white nest, where her snow-white doves, the two Misses Vink, had just returned from Europe to find shelter under the maternal wing, and there await the coming of irreproachable men of their destiny. Not even the thought of the money so painfully scraped together by Almayer and so punctually sent for Nina's expenses could dissuade Mrs. Vink from her virtuous resolve. Nita was sent away, and in truth the girl herself wanted to go, although a little frightened by the impending change. And now she had lived on the river for three years with a savage mother and a father walking amongst pitfalls, with his head in the clouds, weak, irresolute, and unhappy. She had lived a life devoid of all the decencies of civilization, in miserable domestic conditions. She had breathed in the atmosphere of sordid plottings for gain, of the no less disgusting intrigues and crimes for lust or money, and those things, together with the domestic quarrels, were the only events of her three years' existence. She did not die from despair and disgust the first month, as she expected and almost hoped for. On the contrary, at the end of half a year, it had seemed to her that she had known no other life, her young mind having been unskillfully permitted to glance at better things and then thrown back again into the hopeless quagmire of barbarism full of strong and uncontrolled passions had lost the power to discriminate. It seemed to Nina that there was no change and no difference, whether they traded in brick, go-downs, or on the muddy river bank, whether they reached after much or little, whether they made love under the shadows of the great trees or in the shadow of the cathedral on the Singapore promenade, whether they plotted for their own ends under the protection of laws and according to the rules of Christian conduct, or whether they sought the gratification of their desires with the savage cunning and the unrestrained fierceness of natures as innocent of culture as their own immense and gloomy forests. Nina saw only the same manifestations of love and hate and of sordid greed chasing the uncertain dollar in all its multifarious and vanishing shapes. To her resolute nature, however, after all these years, the savage and uncompromising sincerity of purpose shown by her Malay kinsman seemed at last preferable to the sleek hypocrisy, to the polite disguises, to the virtuous pretenses of such white people as she had had the misfortune to come in contact with. After all, it was her life. It was going to be her life. And so thinking, she fell more and more under the influence of her mother. Seeking in her ignorance a better side of that life, she listened with avidity to the old woman's tales of the departed glories of the Rajas, from whose race she had sprung, and she became gradually more indifferent, more contemptuous of the white side of her descent, represented by a feeble and traditionless father. Al Mayer's difficulties were by no means diminished by the girl's presence in Sambir. The stir caused by her arrival had died out, it is true, and Lakamba had not renewed his visits. But after a year, after the departure of the man of war, boats the nephew of Abdullah, Saeed Rashid, returned from his pilgrimage to Mecca, rejoicing in a green jacket and the proud title of Haji. There was a great 
letting off of rockets on board the steamer which brought him in, and a great beating of drums all night in Abdullah's compound, while the feast of welcome was prolonged far into the small hours of the morning. Rashid was the favorite nephew and heir of Abdullah, and that loving uncle, meeting Almayer one day by the riverside, stopped politely to exchange civilities and to ask solemnly for an interview. Almayer suspected some attempt at a swindle, or at any rate something unpleasant, but of course consented with a great show of rejoicing. Accordingly, the next evening after sunset, Abdullah came, accompanied by several other greybeards, by his nephew, that young man of a very rakish and dissipated appearance affected the greatest indifference as to the whole of the proceedings. When the torch-bearers had grouped themselves below the steps, and the visitors had seated themselves on various lame chairs, Rashid stood apart in the shadow, examining his aristocratically small hands with great attention. Almayer, surprised by the great solemnity of his visitors, perched himself on the corner of the table with a characteristic want of dignity quickly noted by the Arabs with grave disapproval. But Abdullah spoke now, looking straight past Almayer at the red curtain hanging in the doorway, where a slight tremor disclosed the presence of women on the other side. He began by neatly complimenting Almayer upon the long years they had dwelt together in cordial neighborhood, and called upon Allah to give him many more years to gladden the eyes of his friends by his welcome presence. He made a polite allusion to the great consideration shown him, Almayer, by the Dutch Gamissi, and drew thence the flattering inference of Almayer's great importance amongst his own people. He, Abdullah, was also important amongst all the Arabs, and his nephew, Rashid, would be the heir of that social position and of great riches. Now Rashid was a haji. He was possessed of several Malay women, went on Abdullah, but it was time he had a favorite wife, the first of the four allowed by the prophet. And, speaking with well-bred politeness, he explained further to the dumbfounded Almayer that if he would consent to the alliance of his offspring with that true believer and virtuous man Rashid, she would be the mistress of all the splendors of Rashid's house, and the first wife of the first Arab in the islands when he, Abdullah, was called to the joys of paradise by Allah the All-Merciful. You know, Tuan, he said in conclusion, the other woman would be her slaves, and Rashid's house is great. From Bombay he has brought great divans and costly carpets and European furniture. There is also a great looking glass and a frame shining like gold. What could a girl want more? And while Almayer looked upon him in silent dismay, Abdullah spoke in a more confidential tone waving his attendants away, and finished his speech by pointing out the material advantages of such an alliance, and offering to settle upon Almayer three thousand dollars as a sign of sincere friendship and the price of the girl. Poor Almayer was nearly having a fit. Burning with the desire of taking Abdullah by the throat, he had but to think of his helpless position in the midst of lawless men to comprehend the necessity of diplomatic conciliation. He mastered his impulses, and spoke politely and coldly, saying the girl was young and has the apple of his eye. Tuan Rashid, a faithful and a haji, would not want an infidel woman in his harem, and seeing Abdullah smile skeptically at that last objection, he remained silent, not trusting himself to speak more not daring to refuse point-blank, nor yet to say anything compromising. Abdullah understood the meaning of that silence, and rose to take leave with a grave salam. He wished his friend Almayer a thousand years, and moved down the steps, helped dutifully by Rashid. The torch-bearers shook their torches,
scattering a shower of sparks into the river, and the cortege moved off, leaving Almayer agitated but greatly relieved by their departure. He dropped into a chair and watched the glimmer of the lights amongst the tree trunks till they disappeared, and complete silence succeeded the tramp of feet and the murmur of voices. He did not move till the curtain rustled and Nina came out on the veranda and sat in the rocking chair, where she used to spend many hours every day. She gave a slight rocking motion to her seat, leaning back with half-closed eyes, her long hair shading her face from the smoky light of the lamp on the table. Almayer looked at her furtively, but the face was as impassable as ever. She turned her head slightly towards her father, and speaking to his great surprise in English, asked, Was that Abdullah here? Yes, said Almayer, just gone. And what did he want, father? He wanted to buy you for Rashid, answered Almayer brutally, his anger getting the better of him, and looking at the girl as if in expectation of some outbreak of feeling. But Nina remained apparently unmoved, gazing dreamily into the black night outside. Be careful, Nina, said Almayer, after a short silence and rising from his chair, when you go paddling alone into the creeks in your canoe. That Rashid is a violent scoundrel, and there is no saying what he may do. Do you hear me? She was standing now, ready to go in, one hand grasping the curtain in the doorway. She turned round, throwing her heavy tresses back by a sudden gesture. Do you think he would dare, she asked quickly and then turned again to go in, adding in a lower tone, He would not dare. Arabs are all cowards. Almayer looked after her, astonished. He did not seek the repose of his hammock. He walked the floor absently, sometimes stopping by the balustrade to think. The lamp went out. The first streak of dawn broke over the forest. Almayer shivered in the damp air. I give it up he muttered to himself, lying down wearily. Damn those women! Well, if the girl did not look as if she wanted to be kidnapped. And he felt a nameless fear creep into his heart, making him shiver again.